Uh, I want to thank Tim very, very much for the, the wonderful invitation and for the wonderful topic. Um, is warm ischemia safe? And I think that you could ask any uh, school age child this question and they're going to say no, even if our friends in Hollywood know this, that if you lose oxygen it will result in death. So, so ischemia is not a good thing. I think the question is, is it tolerable? And I'm going to try to review clinical studies and uh, Dr. Harris did an elegant job of, of, uh, of explaining why these studies really don't give us a great conclusion. Um, so I'm going to try to avoid being too much of a Luddite in going through these. So the first question is why do we need renal ischemia? And there are tumors that do need to come out and there are tumors that, uh, um, that if we didn't temporarily stop blood flow to the kidney when we got in there start operating we'd end up seeing this. And uh, um, we can talk more about this a little bit later. It, all bleeding does stop. And this is what led to off-clamp partials, and we can talk about this a little bit later on then. But uh, the ischemia does injure cells, and I'm not going to go through all the mechanisms. There are many, there's a couple of different mechanisms, but deoxygenation, you get ATP depletion uh, that stops the cells from working correctly, the membrane proteins aren't uh, keeping our electrolytes correct, you start getting electron shifts, cellular stress response with lysis of some cells. And then when you turn things back on with reperfusion, you get lymphocyte activation, which goes ahead and causes inflammatory reactions that cause more cell death. And then these things can also plug up the, uh, the small capillaries in the kidney. So it does injure cells. But we do know that we can um, temporarily stop blood flow from the kidney and things come back. And again, I'm not going to go through, there are a gazillion different mechanisms, many of which we do not understand in terms of repairing injury. And I think this is... Uh, uh, the bottom line is we don't know enough about ischemia of any organ really in the body and how we really treat it and, and reproducibility. Now we do know in terms of looking at some of our very crude measures, and this is a study out of the University of Chicago looking at the percentage change, and I laud you, I hate EGFRs, I really, especially they're used above 60, which really makes no sense, it was never defined for that. But in any event, so what they looked at is just looked at a change in their estimated GFR in patients with two functioning kidneys. And they, again, retrospectively looked at patients either had uh, either in the um, um, cold saline that were used uh, to help uh, to cool the kidney or not cold. And in either case, the cold saline helped in terms of the seeing less immediate change in the GFR. But both of them, there was a linear as you go out, it went out to closer to an hour. There was a relationship, the longer you waited, the more it affected the GFR. The interesting thing in this study was that the 13, median 13-month 13 follow-up, that in these patient populations, it didn't make a difference. Now, did it not make a difference because the kidneys got better? Did it not make a difference because the other kidney took over? We don't, we don't know that um, at this point in time. But from a patient standpoint, if they didn't develop proteinuria, if their blood pressure is okay and whatnot, did it make a difference that they were out to an hour on warm ischemia? We don't, we can't answer that question, but there are definitely some patients who fall into that, that it's okay. In terms of, this is uh, work that we've done in terms of part of this to try to avoid ischemia, uh, we started doing some off-clamp nephrectomies, and this was consecutive patients, they were not randomized patients. But again, a similar sort of finding, initial post-change in serum creatinine, again, creatinine is not a great measure, but in these patients with two kidneys, Initially, there was a, a bigger change, a significant change in their postoperative creatinine in the patients on clamp versus off the clamp. But at six months, it starts, it starts going away. And I think what everyone's most importantly in terms of looking at new onset of, uh, of chronic kidney disease, we had uh, a lower, uh, there was not significant between the two groups. And there are a couple of other studies, one out of Hopkins again, looked at creatinine at warm ischemia less than 30 minutes, no difference between the two groups. Cleveland Clinic tried to do some quantitative work, and there was some other quantitative with functional MRI going on. And they looked at MAG three studies, at least at 30 minutes, they didn't see a difference. And their patients who went over 30 minutes, they started seeing some difference between the kidneys. Um, but again, uh, did it make a difference? Is it better to save part of a kidney and do a longer operation? It's sort of a point that you don't really have a choice. If it's going to take you longer to do the operation, it's going to take you longer to do the operation anyway. You just, as Dr. Harris pointed out, try your best to go ahead and save the kidney. 
Kidney donors, as, as Dr. Harris said, and this is from the New England Journal article, so I'm not going to go too much into this, but the interesting thing is, again, there are things that are risk factors that we can look at beforehand, and in this paper, an older age patient, higher BMI patients, tended to be those that ended up with uh, developing chronic kidney disease. But again, if you look at the patients who ended up with end-stage renal disease, how small, and again, in a healthy population of individuals, the incidence is, is really, really small. So God designed a very good machine when it's, in, when it's made to perfection. Now, what about in solitary kidneys? Because this is really where it counts. And this is a combined study from the Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic with solitary kidneys. And you can see over on the left side, warm ischemia, and on the right side, cold ischemia. But in both groups, there are a significant number of patients that postoperatively developed acute renal failure requiring at least transient dialysis warm ischemia, and then a significant number of patients who are on permanent hemodialysis postoperatively. Uh, and so even the ischemia, uh, ischemia can lead to this, both warm and cold ischemia. Um, and again, so this led some people to do off-clamping uh, off -clamping, uh, partials on solitary kidneys. This is one of the largest series by uh, Dr. Libertino. And I want to thank him for this slide from the, from the Leahy Clinic in Boston. And as you can see here in the non-clamped group versus the clamped group, um, you can preserve kidney function, at least looking at the measurement of GFR in the solitary kidney versus the clamped group. Now again, there, these are not randomized patients and there could be selection bias in terms of size of kidney. Do, uh, are the clamped patients the more difficult tumors? They have to clamp. They end up taking more tissue away and, and whatnot. We can't really say if that is the issue of it or not, but in this very gross state, it looks like it's something that should be saved, and that says the same thing. Something which I think that we don't think enough about, and I'm going to defer to our nephrological colleagues, and by the way, the dean of our new medical school is a nephrologist, so <laughs> it, it's so bizarre. Um, but just like the heart talks to the kidney, our right hand talks to our left hand, We'd be ignorant to think and that the kidneys don't talk to each other, and we just haven't found the factors or the markers or whatnot that they talk to each other. So if one kidney, it may be that if you two, have two kidneys in, do an insult to one side, the other one takes over and sends some messenger or something over to help it re re recuperate or whatnot. We don't know that, but in the, the elegant construction of the body, you would think that it should be there. Something like that should be there. We should probably look for it, and maybe some people have already. I don't know. Now, another thing to think about, controversial, is that there is pre-existing concomitant renal disease in patients who have their kidneys taken out for cancer. And depending upon the study, um, and this is from the Annals of Surgical Pathology, up to 60% of patients have some significant glomerular pathology. So, um, let me, I'll come back in a second. So, the question I ask, we all know patients with testis cancer have lower fertility. Is there something um, in these patients with tumors that, that cause them to have worse kidney function? I don't know, but it is something, is there something in the biology of the kidney? And what struck me this morning on the beautiful talk on the uh, uh, hypoxia-induced factor is that we are just looking at one pathway. So it would be just like looking at the brake system on the front of my car without looking at the brakes on the back, without looking at the parking brakes. All these things interact. And I have to think that uh, when the, um, the hip is floating around uh, the genes, there are microRNAs floating around it that do something else, and they have to affect the microenvironment. We're looking at things, this is the infancy, we're still in the infancy of medicine. Um, and it's important we start identifying the parts to the car, the parts to the cell. But it is, it is, it is easy to see why a one drug model, at least at this point in time, isn't going to work for some of these things. It is much more complex than we give it to. And the fact that we're seeing this here, uh, again, there may be something else on a molecular basis that's causing the tumors that's related to renal disease. We know that in patients on hemodialysis have a higher risk of developing these kidney tumors too. Uh, so there is some relationship. In terms of risk factors for prognosis, are the people we really should go after? And yeah, there are studies that have shown that older patients, males, those with larger tumors, and again, they may because we end up taking out more tumor, more normal kidney. 
If you end up wanting to do a, a uh, clamping of the kidney, it's better to clamp, clamp just the artery, not the artery and the vein. Several studies have shown that when you clamp both of them, it tends to hurt the kidney more. Those, as was mentioned, Dr. Harris's talk would worsening renal function beforehand. And preoperatively, if you can get a biopsy, and the biopsy shows also some of the normal parenchyma, it's important to get that information. Um, and those patients, you have a higher risk of progressing to uh, chronic kidney disease. So what are our options at this point in time? Well, we can try pharmacologic measures to try to preserve the kidney and preserve kidney function. We can try thermodynamic by cooling, and it's one of the first sides of platyzoia that seems to be effective in helping. Regional ischemia, let's not squeeze the whole kidney or stop the blood flow to the whole kidney. And some of the work that Indy Gill is presenting on and using these microclamps is looking at going after that. And then uh, as we're all told in life, just hurry up. Work faster, and the faster you work, the less ischemia you have. So um, I think that the most important thing is, is avoiding ischemia. And the best way to avoid ischemia is exactly what Dr. Jew had talked about this morning, is, is ob observing patients, putting patients on an observation protocol. And we have a large number of patients with some large tumors that we have been, uh, we've been following. We just don't know about the natural history and the natural biology, and I'm going to start saying some more bad things. Um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with the United States. We, we started this Leave No Child Behind program when President Bush was in office. And essentially, it was meant that no child should have a, a low test score, and we can see how we shelved that recently. But the no child left behind philosophy put at all costs make sure everybody is okay. And this is a difficult ethical question. If we are going to save one life out of a million, is it worth spending all this money and all these resources? Now, on an individual basis as physicians, the answer is yes. But in the reality of society, is it practical? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know the answer when they, when they crisscross. And whether 1% of the patients, is, uh, as Dr. Jewett pointed out, his, that develop metastases, is it worth then operating on 99 other patients? Uh, we need to find markers to better identify them. But at this point in time, uh, it's an ethical question. Ablation is another modality where you're not clamping the, the kidneys. But again, the interesting thing, and again, this is patients with two kidneys uh, that looked at laparoscopic ablation, partial ablation. The follow-ups were different in them. But the decline in GFR, the decline in creatinines, again, poor measurements, were no difference between the two groups. Not all kidneys are created equally. And again, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are some factors that uh, we need to look at in terms of uh, um, identifying which patients are we really need to go after in terms of avoiding ischemia at all costs. So in conclusion, um, ischemia seems to be tolerated in most kidneys, with most individuals with two kidneys. And um, I, I'm going to say that you can go up, and studies have shown you can go up in a person with healthy two kidneys, normal kidney functions potentially up to an hour of ischemia. You want to attempt or avoid it or make it as short as possible in people at higher risk, older individuals, people with existing renal disease, individuals with solitary kidneys. And for the younger people in the audience, this is just marvelous because there's so many things we can look at. There's so many opportunities. And this is, I'm proud to say, is my new car. This was built here in the UK, right? So this was an opportunity for Range Rover. Range Rover made these beautiful off-road vehicles that you could see parked outside of Lincoln Center. And these people never used the cars to, to go off the road. But there was an opportunity in this company. They had, for financial reasons, a variety of different reasons, had to go ahead and uh, make something new. And their problem, SUVs got lousy gas mileage. They're really too cumbersome and too big, especially for city life. Trying to park one of these things is, is quite difficult. And they got their engineers together and made quite an elegant car car of the year, SUV of the year this year. And I bought it the first day it was available in the US. It's a wonderful car if you haven't driven it. But it's a matter of taking opportunities with something we have. There need to be prospective randomized studies with and without clamping in variable time of clamping. We need to do, we need to put this together. And my junior guys are starting to put together an IRB. Let's see how it's, it, it's going to be difficult to implement, but it's something that needs to be done. We need to have better predictive models based on individual kidney biology, individual kidney biopsies of the normal function. 
We need better real-time markers of renal injury, and I think this will come up in discussion. Dr. Jew and I were talking about this. Uh, there's a guy down in Texas who's looked at a bunch of these, and unfortunately, what we have right now has not been um, terribly great at telling us, uh, giving us the answer to these questions. We need better ways to assess individual kidney function, and perhaps with the functional MRI, as these studies start coming out, we'll get better information. We need novel non-surgical ways to target and destroy tumors. And this is the future. We're not going to be operating on people. We're going to be doing more ablation, and hopefully we discussed if, if HIFU ever gets there, some sort of variant of that gets there, really to avoid any injury ischemia to the kidney. And look at under mechanisms, really understand the mechanism of renal recovery, re renal crosstalk. Thank you very, very kindly.